her again. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> We're just experimenting. Actually, what I was talking about was we'll try to convert this to a whiteboard. Um, what I wanted to do today is it's just a slightly different than uh, kind of what we what we've done. I uh, see Bridge to Life. This is an illustration or an analogy, if you will, of sharing the gospel with someone. So this is, and I'm not going to do it precisely. People do this differently. I'm not going to do it precisely like this. Uh, there's these little booklets like this up here. I've got a bunch of them. Uh, so there's lots of, and you've got some in front of you there, right? That follow almost the same thing. What does that say? The blue looks like a landscape on it. This one here. Yes. Steps to peace with God. Steps to peace with God. Okay. So that's... Yeah, maybe not the same. That's a little bit different. And there are different ways, you know, to share the gospel. Now, I'm not implying at all in any of this that um, I don't appreciate the complexities of some of these concepts, you know, in the gospel. Uh, but at the same time, I'm just trying to think of a way, as last week we're talking about that lost sheep, going after that lost sheep. And you're building relationships into your life. That is to say, hopefully, you know, you're trying to extend yourself <clears throat> into different places, uh, among different people. Uh, so I, I said or called these like strategic relationships. I don't know that I like that, you know, now that mm -hmm. I've said it, because it sounds like you're sort of using people and I don't like that at all. I think you have general, genuine relationships with people where you don't, you know, and they'll know it in a big hurry if you don't. So you care about the person because God cares about the person. Uh, you want them to know the gospel because God wants them to know the gospel. And you want to find ways as you are um, developing this relationship to get to that point where you've earned enough trust uh, with that person you can share the gospel. Okay, that's all well and good, and we understand that, I think. I mean, that's generally the way if you're going to seek counsel or advice from someone, you generally go to people that know you best. Think of it this way, uh, two words, receptive, responsive, receptive, responsive, receptive, responsive. And if you look in your life, you see that the people that are most receptive to you are likely to be more responsive to the gospel. I mean, that's a bit human, human terms, but I'm just saying that as you build relationships with people, you're going to talk about a whole range of things. Why not the most important thing eventually? You know, that's going to enter into the conversation somewhere normally, naturally, uh, what you believe, why you believe it, and those, those kinds of things. Now, sometimes you don't always have that luxury, you know, and sometimes you just have a sort of coincidental, oh, should I say that? There's no such thing. Um, uh, well, it's something you didn't plan, spontaneous, whatever, at the workplace or somewhere, and you have a few minutes, someone asks you a really profound question, you know, about faith or actually, why do you believe the way you do? If you have a tool that you can just pull out and just basically you're sit, it's a prop, you know, but you're sitting there with them and you can open up the book. So listen, <clears throat> can I tell you, um, you know, what I believe, why, why I believe it. It's in terms of, of God and my own life and what God means to me like that. And you take, and it's very simple, you know, diagram. This is about as simple as it gets in picture sort of diagram through. Same as this, only it would tell you in like four steps, you know, peace with God. The, the motivating thing is all the same, is to have this relationship with God. So I think it's good that, you know, we have a working knowledge of these things. Now, for me, it's been a piece of paper and writing on something. Years ago, uh, you know, we all did our time at Mohawk Furniture in Broad Alban. Everybody, you know, you do your time. Somebody, you're going to work there at some point. So <laughs> um, it doesn't exist anymore except in effigy. But uh, so working there on the line, and when the line broke down, you know, whoever I was working with, I just have a kind of a charcoal something and a big uh, piece of cardboard because it was padded, a padded top. 
And be interesting this day if you could go back and find some of those sketches. <laughs> but it was someone asking me whenever they asked me uh, a question. You know, a few things happened. Number one, uh, I was really, really young, just a, an older teenager. First time I worked there, first first time I did time there, <laughs> and older teenager and. Uh, I wasn't really that vocal about my faith, but people knew I was different. And whenever they'd approach me with, you know, sort of profound questions or questions about faith, something like that, uh, you know, I'd have this kind of routine. Actually, I was a little bit older at the time because we were, well, not too much older, but we were married at the time. And we had bought, Sally and I had this method where we purchased a whole bunch of these, uh, it was called Here's Hope, <laughs> Here's Hope New Testaments. Uh, for like 25 cents a piece, got a whole, uh, I don't know, we must have had a few um, boxes of these. And we would take them and we would go through because we knew people just, hey, here, here's a Bible, just read it. Or here's a New Testament, just read it. I don't know what to look. So we would highlight and then say, go to page, whatever, and highlight. So we were highlighting certain verses so they could literally walk through it. Um, and, you know, if they had to, connect the dots. And sometimes we put a tract like that inside so that they could sort of, Blah, blah, blah. If they ask these types of questions, put it in a plain brown sack, you know, uh, and then when we punched out the next day, I would just, you know, kind of go up behind them and say, remember we were talking and you said, here's something I just want to give you. I wouldn't embarrass them by like handing them this thing where everybody could mock them or something like that. Uh, but it was some way, you know, of sort of getting that. And then if there were more questions out, and there were, and, and you'd be amazed. Pretty soon we had like a little group there of people that were wanting to do this on their break. It was amazing. Uh, you may have a few minutes with somebody or even somebody you know really, really well. And if it comes to that point and you want to like keep on track and not lose track in your presentation, it's helpful to have something like this just to sit down. Plus, you yourself can walk through it, and you can present it, you know, any which any which way you want. But that's the idea behind this. You know, are are you prepared? Are you prepared? Like, if someone, are you fluent enough with your own uh, testimony? Let's just say it that, but your own testimony. Are you fluent enough with that that you could share that with someone else in a way that you don't get sidetracked or go into all these other things and and whatnot. And so that takes a little a little bit of um, getting used to and doing that. So we could uh, play around with this a, a little bit. Um, let me get this thing out of my way. Uh, yeah, so let's just make it up as we go. So you're sitting there with someone and so I just did this actually couple of weeks ago, you know, a few thousand miles away from here, when um, all of my co-workers were laughing because I, uh, one, one Saturday we had two groups we were actually doing. This was this Operation Christmas Child thing. We we're doing different things every day. But on this particular day, we had two different groups of, of sort of young people coming in. We get these packages from Germany. Uh, and then we hold evangelistic events associated with those. First group, 14 to 18 year olds, right? Next group comes in, five and six year olds. And this is where my coworkers are just <coughs> laughing, really. Like, oh, we gotta see what he does with this. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to think. You know, I, first I sent a desperation message to Sally and said, uh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I mean, I'm in big trouble, pray for me. And, uh, you got to love the smartphones and this stuff because you can do that, even though it's six hours difference. But So it had occurred to me in the few minutes back there where I was trying to think of what to do to try to use this type of an analogy. But I found that in, that in doing this with five and six-year-olds, that guess who was on the edge of their seat leaning forward? It was the parents and the grandparents. And I kept asking them, you know, does this make any sense? Am I making sense to your children or whatever? And I kept seeing this, <laughs> you know, like this. Um, you know, not wanting to use word, terms and words. Uh, it's called, you know, putting some cookies on the bottom shelf. 
which I've been told since I was whatever, you know, come on, Doug, put some cookies on the bottom shelf. In other words, you, you're, you're just talking over our heads. You know, you use them, your words are too big, they're too whatever, it's too complex. Let's keep it down here where we can get a hold of it. You know, we want some too, you know, that sort of thing. So uh, that's a challenge anyway. I challenge you to do that. I challenge you to share your faith uh, and in your brain, make believe you're talking to a five or six year old. Uh, we tend to use these and people will nod their head. Like, yeah, I understand something like that. Uh, but they're being nice a lot of times. Maybe they, they don't completely understand. So a couple of things, a couple of disclaimers is when you when you try to do the gospel this way or present something this way, one of the helpful things is, of course, you can be up and this is the, the good time. Most of you like coffee, drink coffee, know about coffee. Uh, you're sitting there with someone. I've done this with FM students. They'd have questions. Hey, what are you doing Saturday morning? You want to just meet over at Dunkin' Donuts? I don't drink coffee. I don't eat donuts, but whatever. Um, we'll meet and have these types of discussions. You can take a napkin. You can virtually anything, except don't write on top of the table itself. But that would be an interesting thing. Take a permanent marker and just, <laughs> it's, it's like there forever. <laughs> But wouldn't that be a convert? This is the table. No, it's this table here we're going to. This one. And it's already there. Okay. But um, uh, however you, you, you do it, you know, um, try to be fluent. Trying to present your, your testimony. Somewhere in your relationship building, uh, there has to be that element. That's your ultimate goal is to be able to share the most important thing you can share you don't want to keep it to yourself. Um, this is the most precious, uh, most intimate, really, message that, that you could share with someone. I think, um, and if we drew like this, like a G here, like that, you can see that, because this isn't exactly, I'd have to reset that, but it, don't make me do it. <laughs> so you can start with just like that, you know, draw a G. What in the world, right? So, and talk about God for a while. However long you want, but talk about God, because that's it. Like, this is it. Before stuff, before stuff. That was a question I had. If Sally was there, I would have asked her the question ahead of time. Like, So I'm leaning over to somebody. I said, do you think kids would grab this concept of before anything else, be before there was all this, there was, you know, no, they're not going to get that, you know. But this is the idea. We're so conditioned to see and stop everything, the world around us that we forget that it wasn't always here. And so, anyway, trying to just say that um, at one time, there was God. God existed. They could talk about God. I don't know, what do you want to say? What do you want to say about God? Uh, so I grabbed one of my older girls from the children's home, and she's like 19, this is Olaf. And I grabbed her, and I and I told her she's, she's God, you know, and so I brought her. <laughs> So I brought her up and I said, okay, you're God. Here you are. Here's this nice, attractive young lady standing in front of the group. Very pleasant. She's smiling, just like God does. She's smiling. And so I can stand there with her and say, now see, um, here's God. Uh, God loves you. Uh, and, I mean, whatever you can say about God, right? E everything you know about God to be, to be true. And... God is a God of love. He's, he's a holy God. That'd be interesting to unpack. That'd be in interesting to unpack. It, ultimately, that means God is separate from everything else. There's God, and then there's everything else. There's God, and then there's stuff that's created. And holiness is ultimately that separation from the God. Is, God is separate. He is separate. He's different. Not to preach on this, but God forbid I should preach. But, you know, when you get into the holiness of God and you think of God being separate and other, I don't know that we always treat him that way. I think a lot of times we treat him, he's just one of us, you know, he's just one of the gang. And we tend to get, even though we should be familiar because we have this Abba Father, this close relationship, sometimes we fail to appreciate just who God really is in his, in his being and character. So however you're doing that, you're presenting God as this holy, good loving, um, caring God, 
and then we're going to find some other things as you go along. So then you bring up somebody else, but you don't do this because you're writing it down. So you put a G on there and you talk about God. Just talk about God. Talk up God. So if you're going to brag on God, this is your time. Put the big G on the paper and then just brag on God. But I will warn you, I will warn you that depending on your friend, they may have some very legitimate and honest problems with your description of God. <laughs> like, and all of a sudden, some of these objections begin to come in, even at this point, you know, where they'll say, but, but wait a minute, if God is, uh, is loving and all that, why did that happen? Why did that happen? Why? And I will tell you, without going far afield here, that the pro what's called the problem of evil, sometimes it's called the metaphysical problem of evil, sometimes it's a philosophical problem of evil, but the problem of evil, not that evil is a problem, of course it is, but the problem of evil means how can you, as a Christian, uh, uh, justify the presence of evil at the same time that you justify an all-powerful, all-loving God? You know, that type of thing. That's the problem for uh, people like us to have to do that. And so sometimes there can be that interjection here. And it's really tough if somebody interjects legitimately. I lost my wife to ovarian cancer. Where was God then? You know, or this, or I lost my child, or this happened to me, or that, or that, you know, or something. Um, it's very hard to say, and perhaps you don't want to say, okay, just hold on to that, because and let me finish. Let me get through this whole thing. You're not going to go anywhere, are you? Because they're going to be stuck on that. And it, but this is good. This is good, because right now you're having an honest, legitimate conversation with someone and you're not putting any spin on it. And we'd have to have a separate conversation as to, um, not so I can give you a clever way of, of spinning your way out of that, but an actual real uh, answer to that question. And even with an actual real answer to that question, they may not want to accept that either. You know, And, and that's okay. But the point is, you're talking. You know, you're having this. Now, if this is fine and you can you can keep going, then uh, sometimes you, people put like an M there for man, but I find that a little gender specific in our, forgive me for this, but I, I just don't do that anymore because it, 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 people are really sensitive to that. God and man, you know, and they'll think of it as a gender instead of like humankind or mankind. So I usually just say people or us, like we did the other night, the story of us, you know, this this kind of thing. So then you start talking about people, and maybe just in the general sense of how people are different from God, because God is this, and we are we are this. And still saying staying in somewhat simple terms, so you get the difference, you know, God, people, and this idea that God created people, you know. So before everything was, there was God, but now there's stuff. And with all the stuff, God made people. God made us. And as you, as you continue on through that, um, you find that a problem develops. Uh, what I like to do, like what I did with the kids, is I, I took two chairs and I sat God down. And then I sat people down and made them face each other in chairs. All right? And so I had them hug, you know, we're hugging each other, we'll high five each other, we'll shake hands, well, whatever you want to show this was all good. Here's God, he created, here's stuff, here's human beings, and put them in this relationship, gave them a nice place to work, and all that stuff, uh, and here's this great, great relationship. So that's what you have. You know, God created, and this is all. This is what we know. It's that simple. However you want to elaborate, whatever you want to do, but I'd say don't go crazy. But just in general terms, so people can separate in their mind, yeah, God, before all things, different from the rest of us. We're different in some way, different from him, in that we are created. We're stuff that God made. And yet, at the beginning, all this was good. Wonderful relationship. Nothing between us and God. Had this relationship. Now... The key is uh, projecting forward that this is where you're going to end. This is where you're going to end. You're going to begin with God and people, God and you, having this wonderful relationship. 
something's going to happen. God's going to remedy that situation, and then you're going to be restored, but that's going to require a response. It's not automatic, and so this is going to, you're going to go full circle to the point where you're back here. And if you were doing it with live people like, like this, you start with hugs and hype and everything else, and you finish with hugs and hype. It, you know, it's really good. Sometimes I do it where I mimic the cross like this, or I have an actual cross in back of me, you know, and have somebody walking toward me that, that recognizes this is Jesus, this is who Jesus is, and that's what I want, that's what I need, and the closer you come, and then the arms come around you like this, and you're restored to this relationship. So that this whole thing is about God creating man, man blowing it, God doing what it took to put it back into order, mankind receiving that, and you, you come full circle. That's what you do. So um, here's this idea of, of sin, right? So um, let's do this. It's a little bit lower. So if you draw like these two cliffs like this, just to represent the fact that everything was fine until, until what? This is really simple. You know, but this makes a point. Until um, God told people how um, how He expected them to live, He gave them some expectation, and He gave them a law, actually, a rule, a rule. And uh, if you remember, Andrew, you remember when we were over at FM and we were doing this whole thing similar to this? Okay, so we did the whole thing, and then. I said something about, just facetiously about how, well, you know how God is. God's always trying to wreck the party. So he gave us, and I hold up my Bible, this complicated thing to understand. It's just full of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rules. And I figured from the non-Christian community, you're going to hear, amen, you know, preach it, brother. That's it. There's no way we can do it. And yet, how many rules did it take to mess us up? And somebody said 10. And I said, well, you're too far ahead in the text. It just took one. Now, that's a sobering realization, right? One. That's all, he had to, that's all God had to do with human beings was just stick. Everything else is, is great, but just one. Of course, you don't have to go to all this detail. But the idea somehow here is to be able to help people understand what sin is. That's a word that is almost, it's strictly a kind of what, a religious term or something? And most people, if you say sin, well, I don't know. I'd have to talk to most people, you know, as to what, what do they think about when they, you know, it must be something. Some people would say it's like murder or stealing something or lying or, or anything like that. And so somewhere in there, you know, you have to say that, this was God's will. This is what, what God said he wanted. And people decided to do otherwise. And in here, you know, there are these verses that you can memorize. Like Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let's say like that. And you say, you know, even the Bible. And if you have these verses marked, and you happen to have a little New Testament or something, you can see, just to show them, so them taking your word for it. See what this says in the Bible? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, your question in reading that, if you never read the Bible before, and you come to Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, what's your first question? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When? <laughs> all have sinned. It doesn't say all sinned. It says, all have sinned. It's very important. Same thing in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, another one. Wherefore, as, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, though this were death passed upon all men for the law of sin, which means the reason why we die physically is rooted in sin, ultimately. But anyway, don't get into all that. Just to say, what's my goal at this stage? My goal at this stage is to help them understand that there is now a barrier between human beings and God, there's a barrier that's been put there. And when you have the chairs together like this, God, I mean, God says this, whatever, is you have people, you turn the, the chair this way. Turn the chair this way. I'm going to go my own way. Like this, which is sin. I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to have it my way. I'm going to do it my way, not God's way. Anything that's less than God's way is 
Uh, with kids, sometimes I do like this, you know, like something you do, something you say, or something you think, like this with, with sin. But you're turning at going away. And because of that, because you've turned your back on God, because of your sin, your disobedience to him, God does what? He's turned his back on you. Uh, I mean, that's really graphic with an audience to do that, to physically do that. It's really a graphic thing to think, wait a minute. Sin isn't just like something, but sin has actually separated me from God. And that's all you're trying to demonstrate here. You're trying to demonstrate, first of all, what sin is. It's rebellion against God in any form. I mean, in any form, thought, word, and deed, in any form. It's rebellion against God. And so what did it cause? All have sinned. So he, he's saying there was a time when collectively the human race, and please don't get into this with your, I'm just saying for our benefit, there was a time collectively when the entire human race became guilty of rebelling against God, as strange as that sounds. Why? Because Adam is the first representative head of the race, and he, we are his progeny. Something happened to the race then that impacted the spiritual condition of everybody ever since. So you're already born into this world with a record. You're born guilty. You're, and this is hard for people to understand, but this is what this all have sinned and the impact of it is, which is to say, you can say, well, in the beginning it was like this, but now it's different. No, this is, this is who we are if we have not... Um, if we have not made use of, you know, God's means of fixing this thing. <clears throat> so however you, you represent that to show that there is a, a separation. Um, separation. So uh, all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. How about this one? How about Romans 6, 23? For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Really simple, right? The wages payment, the penalty. So sin is not like in a vacuum. Sin is against God. Sin is against God, and it has a penalty with it. We can understand that's pretty simple. We break the law, there's a crime, there's a, there's a crime committed and a penalty for it. We break God's law, there's a penalty for it, and he says that penalty is death. So what would it mean to put things right with God then? Okay, so if I did wrong, I deserve death because that's my penalty. That's just God being, now we find out God is a just God. God actually punishes disobedience and that punishment is death. So in order, in order for me to cancel out that sin that I've done, it's going to require a death, but it, it's not my death. It's, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, my death could cancel that out. Um, and so we're, we're seeing the wages of sin is, is death, um, but the gift of God then is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So it would be the opposite. So death, we exchange death for eternal life because of something Jesus brings to us, but that's getting ahead of this a little bit. So what do we want to understand here is things like, um, you know, So things like, oh, I can't write three, and 623, like that, like those two verses. And we, 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 we want to plant that concept of both sin, what sin is, separation, that's what you're trying to illustrate, and death. In other words, if nothing happens now, if nothing happens, nothing happens, and that's it, this person dies. You could talk about what death is. You know, and the Bible speaks of it in a couple of different senses and all in terms of separation. This is separation. So physical death is a separation of the material and immaterial parts of human beings. We put the corpse in the ground. The person goes out into eternity for God's disposition of where they're going to spend eternity ultimately. But then this kind of second death the Bible talks about is when we go out into eternity, not having a savior. And we're separated from God forever. Wow, that's, that's tough, but that's real. So 
this is dead. This is dead. And so they begin to die, you know, this original couple. But, but we're dead in the sense of being dead to God. I mean, dead in that sense of cut off from God. Uh, and that can explain a lot of things about life for people. Like you're in this here and saying, okay, I've, I've not um, received what Jesus came to give personally. And that can explain, here, here I am living in this world, um, uh, experiencing this kind of, uh, what did B Billy Graham used to call it, cosmic loneliness. <laughs> this kind of like a weird sense of loneliness, like, I'm in a room, I've got all these people, I have all these friends, I, I have a great job, I have a great family, I, I have everything, except there's this, just this wretched, deep unsettledness, and I don't get it, I don't know what that is, and it, what it is is you're cut off from your creator. Conversely, then, you have this relationship with God, and you cannot have all the wealth. You cannot have the, the health. You cannot have the notoriety, the popularity, and everything else. But somehow within your being, you know all is right. Yeah. Because I have this relationship with God. Not that you have to have it that way. So those are the things that, that you bring out here. Um, then I think you, would, I, you, you should pose this thing then. So you could ask some questions. You could ask like some comprehension questions, but be careful about doing that because when you do, everybody's going to say yes, yes. Do you understand? Sure. Okay. So maybe say, well, you know, what do you think sin is? Yeah, you, know, you could ask them that, like, all right, off the bat, what do you what do you think sin is? And then they'll they'll tell you, and they'll say, could I could I tell you like what the Bible says sin is, and show you a couple of verses? There you go. Well, now human beings. <laughs> We're a piece of work, you know, so we have this way, like a toddler. I can do it. I can do it myself. I'll do it. That's it. So we have this thing like when we discover that there's something wrong here, we say, I'm going to be a bridge builder. Watch me build a bridge, <laughs> you know, and we start building bridges. And that's what religion does, doesn't it? Religion says, let me tell you, I got the plans for a bridge. You won't believe it. And if you just build it this way. And maintain it this way, it'll get you there. But it's the ultimate bridge to nowhere. You know, you'd think it was designed by the U.S. Senate. It's this bridge <laughs> to nowhere. Um, so how about, you know, you just maybe anticipate a bunch of these. So you start, like, building this bridge, which could be religion. This could be, but I'm a good person. Uh, and they are. And never dispute that. Never dispute that about someone being a good person. If they say, but listen... Um, I'm a good father. I, I, I uh, coach my kids' teams. I, I, what else is there? I, uh, I give money to the Salvation Army. I do, you know, any number. I, I don't know what could it be. Good person. Never dispute that. Never dispute that. Because it's, it's of no consequence. They're talking horizontally, aren't they? They're talking about I'm good with respect. And sometimes people want to take issue with that and say, there's no one good but God. You know, this Romans 3.10, you know, there's like, there's no one good. So, but, but that's not the context they're talking about. They're talking about relative goodness among people. But that's exactly not what we're talking about when it comes to the gospel. And you could say, well, well, I get that. I get that. You're not a, you're not a fallen down drunk. You're not a drug user. Uh, you're not into child pornography. You're not a murderer. You're not, I don't know, any of these heinous things which they tend to mean those are the bad people, but I'm, I'm a good people. So we don't, don't dispute that, but say, listen, um, the measure of goodness, of course, is not this way horizontally, but it's this way. Am I as good as God? Um, for example, when Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll perish. You won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine the Jews listening to that? And this guy, who's supposed to be some teacher from God, says, hey, you know what? I, I've got the answer for you. You know how good those scribes and Pharisees are, which they were good in and of themselves, which meant they, they set up their own standards and invited everybody to live by those standards that they're going to enter into that community. And so Jesus says, 
as perfect as they are or purport to be, you have to exceed that. Well, see, people would not enter into a pharisaical type of community, this closed community, because for a year they had to be observed, and they said, well, I can't do that. There is no way I can't live like those people. I won't do it. So I'll just, you know, appreciate them and everything else, but I'm not going to live among them. I'm not going to do that. And Jesus says, unless it exceeds that, you won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. Then you go down from verse 20 to verse 48, and he says, be perfect. This is what he tells them. Be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Would that blow your mind? If you're a Jew, saying, this guy, you know, I thought he was a little with the whole Pharisee righteous thing, but now I know he's, he's gone. He's off it. But see, Jesus never does share the gospel in the Sermon on the Mount, but what he does is he creates this appetite for my word. If what, what is it? How do I get how how do I get where I can be right more righteous than the Pharisees? How do I get to that state of perfection where God can accept me? So Jesus just gives the standard. Hey, you know what it is to have a life with God? Perfection. You won't live five minutes in this world and realize that's not me. I'm not perfect. And so this is what Jesus is saying. Ultimately, it's in him. It's in him that we're going to be given this righteousness and stuff like that. So I'm just saying all this, the good, and you talk about the relative goodness, the relative goodness and the objective goodness, maybe, but don't use those terms. You know, like comparing ourselves to each other, uh, we really will never know what the ultimate you know, standard is. We won't know. But when we start to look at God, because that's where we started, here's God, nothing else. Who's God? He's good. He's perfect. He's right, just, and all these things. That's the standard for having a life with us. We created us that way until we messed it up. You know, and now we say, hey, you know what the answer is? We got to figure it out. We got to find, boy, God will be happy. He's going to love it. I'm telling you, this religion is so cool. Uh, we've got a holy book, and we've got a bunch of rituals to do, and we actually then structure it in such a way that we know precisely when and how and what you should look like, how you should dress, what you should eat, how you should sleep, and anything, anything, anything. And then we'll know that we're good because we've achieved that. Um, so you can play all day with that. So there's a number of these of these types of bridges. So you want to get to God's God's remedy. Um, pick a, so God's remedy. And here you can say, well, okay, so you have this, you have this cross then, something like this. But whatever you use, however you do this, you just kind of bridge the whole thing. And then you then you can brag on Jesus a little bit here. Because you said Jesus then is that. And you have to talk about it. So, like John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever, whoever, that's you, that's you, that's whoever, whoever you're sitting with, put their name in, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You remember the word lost from the lost sheep? It means like fully destroyed. Whatever the, whatever the negative is, ruined, destroyed, you have to add fully to it completely fully so when he says that you won't perish but you'll have eternal life perish is that same word that means that's the state you're in right now because you haven't believed not the state you will be but take this away and you're in this condition trying to either do your best to get over there which you never can but maybe by degrees you're better than i am most people are so if, if we all lined up on the shore of California, and our goal is to swim to Hawaii, well, you know how far I'm going to get. You know, out here sink like a rock. Now we might have an Olympic swimmer that might go out there about 15 miles, I don't know, but we're just, you're not going to make it. You're not going to get there. Um, so this is the predicament. Um, John, John 5.24 uh, let me get it right. John 5 24 says, uh, Very truly I tell you, this is Jesus, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but is crossed, crossed from death into life. Okay, just 
and you won't share this, but it's a perfect tense verb, which means it's a one-time thing and the effects are permanent. So you don't, you don't jump over, jump back, jump back, jump over, jump back, jump back. This is like this, you know, you, you pass from. You can know when you believe the simple message of the gospel and say, that's what I believe, that's what I believe. I'm resting all my confidence about spending an eternity with God on what the Bible says, on this gospel message, this good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus came so that by his death, the wages of sin is death, so that his, by his death, I am forgiven, and his goodness, his righteousness has been added to me. This is how God sees us. So God as a judge can say you're not guilty because you are not guilty. God made you not guilty. God gave you that perfection as God sees you. God put God has restored you back into that position we were created to be with him. But this is something that that we must receive. This is something that we must take. This is our response. God doesn't force it on us. See, look at it this way. When God, go all the way back to being, there was God, there was nothing else, and there was people. These people had the capacity to choose. They had the ability to choose. God set it up that way. What kind of worship would it be if you created drones that were programmed, we love you, God, God, you're number one, God, we do everything. That's not worship. Mm -hmm. Worship isn't worship unless you choose to do it. God won't force you to that. And so here you have it, um, at least from our vantage point, you know, let's not get too theologically twisted here. But when we, when we come to this point, we're back into that position with him that restored, unimpaired. So when you got the chairs, it's like this. I went my own way. God had to turn his back because I'm unholy. Jesus died. Chair comes back this way. God's making his appeal. I keep going. I keep going. I keep going. But God's like that father, you know, the prodigal son, waiting, waiting, waiting like this. This is God, arms open wide, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting for you to what? Turn. See, religion, here's what religion does. Religion says, I can fix this thing um, by going faster in this direction. I mean, that's how guys generally navigate. When we're lost. We step on the gas, you know, we just go faster. It's not helping. That's not the course correction. What you need is a course correction to turn. That's repentance. Repentance is when we turn. We realize there's danger up ahead. Judgment of God waiting for us. Instead, we turn and we discover the love of God. And here's the Lord Jesus just waiting, just waiting. And this puts puts things back, back in order. So you can see how taking a little napkin or something, and draw on a few little squiggly lines. And honestly, you don't know which way you're going to go. That depends on the person, doesn't it? Depends on the person and the kind of questions. And it's really, honestly, okay if all you get is a G on a piece of paper, and that's as far as you get. Leave the door open. Next time, maybe you'll get to the P, and next time, maybe you get to something else. But um, so do this. I command you, no. Um, try this. Try this. Like. Um, you know, make, try to make it a point this year. I mean, honestly, pray to God and say, God, uh, I'd love to be able to just, number one, I want to know for sure about me. And then two, uh, I want to develop relationships where I could really talk to people, really help people. Unless you're convinced that you're really helping people by sharing this basic message, but this gets you to the threshold. This gets you to the door. This gets you there where you can start this life with, with Jesus. Um, but pray about that. I pray about it. Say, God, please uh, bring people into my life. I don't know. That's, that's the right prayer. Uh, maybe it's more like, God, would you take me by the scruff of the neck, by the seat of the pants, and throw me in the middle of a bunch of people I don't know? I, that's better. <laughs> now, that's biblical. Okay, you want to know where I get that from? Take Matthew 9, Matthew 9, uh, pray the Lord of the harvest that he might, what? Trust out laborers into his harvest. It's ekbalo. Go to chapter 10, verse 1 of Matthew, that verb ekbalo. It's, it's the same verb for Jesus casting out demons. 
And if you don't think that was a violent act, those demons coming out of somebody, it's the same word. Throw me out. Throw me out. Cast me out. And pray that. Now, he might mess your life all up. <laughs> seriously. He might seriously mess you up. But when it happens, this is what God always does. Stoke, 100%. Stoke percent. 100%. This is what God does. He intends to put you in the middle, right in the middle, the object of attention, right in the middle of a group of people that need him. Maybe not an assembled group like this. For example, because we don't have time and it's all gone. If, if each one of us were just to do this, one circle, that's me. And we did that every person in the room and say, well, who, who are these people in your life like this? Who are these? And we started to identify these people. Remember, receptive, responsive. Who are these relationships? And we'd find that if we did that, for all of us, some of these would overlap because we'd know the same people like that. But we'd see quite a number of people. Like how many people would you have to build a relationship with so that you could have that conversation with them? Who are they? Could you name them? And if you could, or just say, well, these are the people, but... You know, maybe there, maybe these aren't really particularly close to me, and and these aren't, and something. You know, this is something else. You begin to categorize that, and say like like red, uh, green, like no, red, 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 yellow, red, amber, and green. Red being they're in my life. I have no relationship with them. How do you get that to yellow, to where you're sort of like, okay, we've talked, we're getting there, to a green where we've got a pretty decent, and you start doing this and say, it's. Listen, you know, I mean, being a Christian and doing what we're supposed to do, and that is um, share our faith, is hard work just to get to that point. The people that do it wrong are the people that think it's easy and just go out shouting at people, you know, and telling them, shouting them down and telling them they're all going to hell or something like that. Are they right? You know, we're not talking about right. We're talking about being an effective communicator, being a loving, compassionate communicator of the gospel. And so it's building those relationships. You'd find that there's probably 100, 150 people within our wheelhouse, people that if we pray, really pray earnestly about that, God put me in the right place, uh, that we can have those types of conversations in genuine relationships, because I really believe this is the message that they need. This is the message that can change their life. This is the message that um, will transform every aspect of their, of their life. And then sit down and have this type of, you know, and it may take several little pieces of it. One thing you'll find, you'll find out where they are in this subject. And the thing is, you won't have to raise it. They will. Because they're going to be around you long enough to figure out you're not like them. I mean, maybe like them in a lot of ways. Same, You like the same things, you laugh about the same stuff. But ultimately, there's just something, hmm, something that's just a little different. Lord, thank you for uh, this kind of uh, run around this subject, but it's important to all of us, absolutely every single one of us, because we do care, but overwhelm us with a sense of care for our, our, our neighborhood, our streets, our, our cities. There are 12,000 people within a three-mile radius of where we're sitting right now, 12,000 people, and we know so many of them, but we don't even know them. And yet, so we're trying to find ways, creative ways, where we can, you know, get among them. They can get among us, stuff like that. Um, but help us just in our daily sort of out there on the job, doing the stuff, to sort of see people differently. Um, Jesus saw them as sheep having no shepherd. H how can we see them and then begin to do little things to show we have an interest in them. We care about them. We care about what they care about. And ultimately to show them the absolute good news. It would just be a wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. Wonderful. So help us to kind of keep on message with that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
your steadfast. I will sing and make music. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing to you, O Lord. It's going to come in hard with the guitars. Oh, I can see the